Eat what you're doing. We're supposed to bring your snack. I know. This is the bar. Does that mean you are star? It's on? Okay. So last week we were on the uh, book background method of Bible study. And like I said, we used Galatians, the epistle to the Galatians, as an example of how you would go about doing a book background method of Bible study. And then uh, I used uh, material from William Barclay's book, The Letters to the Galatians and Ephesians. And what we are trying to do is, in order to, stand, to understand that book, in order to understand Galatians, you will need to do a background on Galatians. Okay? You can't just get in the book of the Bible and you start reading because you may not get the full flavor of the message without having an understanding of the background. So what we did was we explored Galatians beginning with why it was written. So in the first part, we did uh, what we call Paul under attack. Paul under attack. And the reason why we began like that was the way Paul started the epistle, if you don't understand the background of it, it will appear to be very strange. Here's how he started. And I'm using the New Living Translation. If you have your Bible, you can follow. If you don't have, that's fine. But this, this is how he starts. Galatians chapter 1, starting at verse 1. This is what he says. This letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, that's how he started. Look at how he started. He said what? He was not appointed by any human authority or by any group of people, but by God himself. Verse 2, all the brothers and sisters who are here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. Then in verse 6, he said, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God. Who raised you, who called you to himself through the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. Okay? So the language he uses will tell you that there is a background to this book. Okay? He said he is shot, he is not appointed by any human authority. That clearly gives you an indication that something must be happening. Uh, and it gives you the reason why Paul wrote this epistle. He said, I'm not appointed by human beings. So, he is not appointed by human beings. He is, uh, and then he said he is shocked that they are turning from the message he preached. Okay? So, those are the things. So, now, if you want to understand this epistle, then you would need to do some kind of background search, which is the method that we are studying here. And if you look at your notes, we started by saying there are two things that are happening. One is Paul under attack. He is being attacked. Paul under attack. So, and we found out that he is attacked on two grounds. One, that they said his, his, his enemies are saying that he is not an apostle. So that's why he is referring to he's not an apostle. And then we said, if you look at lecture seven, we said that in, the, in some sense, Shala, uh, that could be th true. Because if you look in Acts chapter one, I believe it's verse 21, the, uh, when Judas killed himself and they had to replace him. Who was the, uh, by the way, who replaced Judas? Acts chapter one. It was Matthias. And we don't hear much about Matthias after that. But the, uh, the qualification of an apostle that he gave was, was twofold. One, you have to be somebody 
who have witnessed the Lord's baptism, who have been with the Lord from the baptism of John to the resurrection. So you see immediately that Paul does not meet these qualifications. Okay? So the, the Paul's op op opponents were saying that he's not really an apostle because he was not there when the Lord was baptized and he was not there when the Lord resurrected. So that's the charge they were making. And so Paul is, uh, and then we said the other problem that Paul had was he had been a persecutor of the church. So all these things here, his opponents were saying that disqualified Paul from being an apostle. He wasn't there when Christ was baptized. He wasn't there when he was resurrected. And then he had been a persecutor. And the way Paul answered that was, so that's why he is answering here. They know you might be appointed me. Uh, my, my appointment came directly from God. Okay? This, how, this is how you would do a background study. The other thing, is that, is that I'm getting it? Okay. Now, if you didn't have that background, you probably not understand the book. Then we also need to find out Paul's, who are these people who are opposing Paul? Who are his opponents? Or who are his enemies? We found out these were what we call Judaizers. These were people who were Jews who had turned to Christianity. And they were insisting that before, even though you are a Christian saved by grace, you still have to follow the Jewish law. Okay? You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the Jewish purification uh, rites. Both of these charges, they find that Paul was not an apostle. And then they were attacking his message that only... And Paul was saying, the only way you get saved is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Okay? Now, do you see why sometimes it's essential to do a background study on the book? Because that is not in the book. You won't know that if you don't do a background study on the book. Um, yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So how, when do you know to use this as a method? Well, that's a good question. When will you need to do it? Ah, well, you were in church last Sunday. I know uh, uh, Shalom is not here, Helmut and Estella. But I was preaching from Ecclesiastes chapter what are you from? Nine. Chapter nine, and and there's Solomon said what the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Uh, the educated person is not necessarily wealthy, and on and on like that. And he said, it's all decided by what? No, no, no. Chance. He said it's decided by chance. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so, if you were to look at that, if you go preach, now, look, <laughs> everything that we have in this life is decided by chance. <laughs> you see that? So you will need to know the background, who wrote this and at what time. And as we know, Solomon was a man of wisdom, but Ecclesiastes comes across as taking, using human wisdom to look at situations in life. So yeah, when do you use this method? I think it, it, it's helpful if you want to get a better understanding of, of the book or a passage. Uh, let me see another example. But so, which book would you know to use it? Well, now, now any particular that like the definition says you can use it on, you can use it on a passage of scripture. Uh, you can use it on a person. You can use it on an event. You can use it on a topic that you are studying. For instance, I always make mention of a thing. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Right? Philippians 4, verse 19. What did they say? My God will supply all your needs according to now 
Who is she writing to? You see, you see the background there? My God will supply all your needs. Okay? Suppose you wanted to preach. And then you go to any kind of church. And you say, God will supply all your needs, no matter what. Based on that text. Philippians 4.19. Right? Mm -hmm. It would be right and it would be wrong. Because you have to know who he's writing to. What kind of church is he saying God will meet all your needs? We know that it was a Philippian church. They were very poor. But they were very generous. And Paul said it was their generosity that God will reward. He said they had given over and above their ability. Hmm? Mm -hmm. it, it is that kind of church that God will supply your needs. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if you don't know that, you just say any kind of believer who's not even giving to God, who's not sacrificing, that will not be a correct use of that passage. Okay? So you need to have some kind of understanding of where did. And where do you find that? If you read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, you see about the church in Philippi. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Let's use another passage. For God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him. What is the background of that? It's our Lord speaking, but who was he speaking to when he was saying that? No, okay, let's use, leave that. Let's use the one, except a person is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, see, that's your text you want to preach. Where did he get that text from? John chapter 3. When did Jesus make this statement? He was talking with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was saying, but how can you be born again well, you need to enter your mother's womb. It was in response to that that Jesus is saying, except you be born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You get the point I'm making? So, it is very necessary that you don't take a passage out of context and you just start applying it like that. And the background said it helps you to do a better job. Am I making sense? Over and over again, I, I have for him. To remind you people of going back to the text and developing. I mean, last Sunday I struggled because I was trying to find out what the what the title of the sermon would be. Okay, and the only one I could come up with was uh, a wise man's principles of success. Where did I get it from? I got it from the text. Okay. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what we did on, uh, with Galatians. That's what we did last week. That it is very, and these days, oh, I was going to bring a book. Quick, quick question. Sure. Um, you see the... No, we haven't gotten on this no, one no. yet. Yeah, using the uh, book. Book background. Background, mm -hmm. okay. Some people have a, a tendency to say there's a historical aspect, whereas the past, mm -hmm. the present, or the future, so then, you saying okay, the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you apply? Let's assume some people say, "Oh, but it was spoken during those days," and other, and it can be applied now or in the future. How do you distinguish that? Okay, you are saying three things that are. Let me see this. In the uh, past. Mm -hmm. You are preaching today, how do you make that relevant to the present time if it was something that took place in the past? It's okay, let's... All right, let's answer Herman's question. Why do we just need in Galatians? Okay, but let's let's use an example of uh, 
Women covering their head in church. I was um, thinking of that. <laughs> I was thinking of that. That was my question on that. Okay. So, and maybe you want to preach on the, you're taking your text from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Okay? So that's what you want to do. Now, next semester I want to do advanced preaching. How do you even come up with a title of a sermon? Where do you get it from? How do you get topics to preach on? But let's say the Holy Spirit just leads you. There are women who come to church in your church who don't wear anything on their head. Hmm. Or there are other people who are preaching something false that you want to correct in your church. That's the basis of your sermon. So you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and Paul said, uh, women should cover their head in church, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So then you say, well, that's in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay? So then how do you now bring it to the future? What do you do with women in the church who don't cover their head? Mm -hmm. You see what you're trying to do now? Mm -hmm. Paul, there's another one. Kiss the brethren with a holy kiss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? That, that, that one of the gentlemen we used to know from Tulsa, he used to go to uh, the Azerbaijan, one of the Soviet republics. And when they go there, when they go there, <coughs> they, uh, the men there insist, I mean, they, they kiss, you know, when they see each other, you know, they really kiss you on the lip. Okay. And when, when, uh, when uh, Gordon, Gordon goes there, he said, may I come from that place? And, but they are, that's what they do. Okay. So, you read the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul admonishes the woman that they should tie their head, they should cover their head when they come to church. So then you are faced with the problem. Now, how does it come in the present? So that's why I would say that's the use of it. So what are you going to do? You're going to have to find out, like you said, historical, cultural, or theological. Here is another one. In First Timothy, Paul said, I do not allow women to preach. And the reason he gave for it was Adam was born first and then Eve second. So what is he doing? He's giving a theological reason for it. But then there are people who are saying it is a cultural reason because in those days both historical and cultural in those days, one, women were not educated. Second, they were considered lower class. Okay? Are you still following what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, in the, in the case where the Paul is saying women should not, we should be, to cover their head in church, how will you interpret it? Is it a cultural issue? That's how the women at that time used to live. That's how the church was behaving. Or is it a theological issue that applies in the past, in the present, and in the future, all time? Here's one we can use, the Lord's Supper, right? We use bread and we use grape juice. This is a practice, right? Mm -hmm. It is a church practice that we use. It remains unchanged in the past, in the present, and the future. For all times, it will always apply. We can't say, oh no, we can't do the Lord's Supper because at that time, the people used to come together to eat, so that's why. So today, we don't need the Lord's Supper. You see what I'm saying? This is a practice that is good for all times. Whereas covering the head might be only for the past. Mm -hmm. 
It may not apply, and I'm not saying, that depending on what church you come from and what your theological position, but there are churches that don't apply this today because they believe it was it belong in the past. No, but after church, you gotta cover your head. Well, that's what, but if you go to other churches, they don't cover their head, and what would be their reason? The reason is it applies to the past. You see what I'm doing with that? Okay. So you have to get some sense of, uh, all right. So that was last week. Let, we got to move now to this week. I was just trying to do a, a quick overview of last week. And <clears throat> those of you who are missing class, please make sure you listen to the lectures so I don't have to repeat too much. All right, tonight then, we, uh, we are on the book survey method of Bible study. Book survey. We just finished book background. Now we are doing book survey method. And here we say it is comprised of three ways of doing that. The first one is the first one is what? We do the survey, which is an overview. And number two, we do the analysis. which is detailed. Maybe of each chapter, chapter and verse. And then we complete that with a synthesis. And we draw conclusions. Or we summarize. Okay? This is the approach we take. To analyze is to break down something. And then to synthesize is to group together. Okay? So tonight, here's what we are doing. Again, because you people are writing your paper on Galatians, I decided that I will look at Galatians again. Okay? And what I did is, I'm giving you an outline so you can understand the book. Okay? Everybody here? Mm -hmm. Alright. So I did, I took from Ryrie's Bible, but I changed some of the wording because sometimes they use too much of big, big terms. But you can get this, typically you can get it from any good Bible. I use Ryrie's study Bible. Okay, so we begin first. I Paul starts with an introduction. Okay, by the time we are done, you will be able to write your paper so well you understand Galatians so well because we are using this as our case uh, study. All right. Um. So Paul starts. Okay? Now, you've done a background study on the book of Galatians already, right? Mm. So presumably you have an understanding of what the book is about. Now, you want to understand. You want to do a detailed study. So, chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 10, Paul writes the introduction. What including the introduction? He is defending the gospel that he preached. He defending. Now, why do you what you remember what we just said from the beginning? He is being attacked that he's he is not he is not a real apostle. So the first thing he tries to do is defend the gospel. That what the message I'm preaching. And that can be found in chapter 1, verse 1 to uh, 10. 
Now, you can take this and then you understand the whole book of Galatians. Let me go over, let go over it briefly, then we do. And then, uh, chapter, then he now defends this message. So he, here, he is defending his apostleship. And then, uh, from 2, you know, 1, 11 to 2, 21, he is defending this message he is preaching. And the message is justification by faith. Now, I think so, some of you were in the class. This word, this word, sometimes some people might dump it in the Google or in the Bible study methods we are using. Okay? What do we mean by justification? It is a big term. So one of the things we said we, you were going to do was try to define your terms. Okay? Paul did not use justification by faith, but you look at the word justify. Uh, declare righteous. Let me impress you people also. Okay? Sometimes we say to justify somebody is to declare the person righteous. Right? Mm -hmm. Helmet owes Margaret $500. And she doesn't have the ability to pay. Magdalene comes and pays Margaret. Then I say, now Hellman is declared debtor, non delinquent to Margaret. Oh. Okay? Because or somebody paid for somebody her. Pay for her. Oh. Or if I have the uh, money, I can say, I declare you, you don't owe me any money. Okay? Mm -hmm. I am not saying she has fully paid it. But somebody did. So I declare her not owing the money. Well, only a good person would do that. Well, but that's what Paul is saying. <laughs> that the message he is pre preaching is called only faith in Christ can save somebody. Okay. So he is saying the sinner who comes to God is not declare righteous on the basis of obeying the law. But God justifies, declare the sinner righteous by faith. That's what he is saying. Again, I want you to remember, justification doesn't mean the person is not guilty. He is simply saying, I declare you, you who are guilty, I now declare you free. Remember now, it has nothing to do with holiness. Huh? It has nothing to do with human efforts, as you have been hearing from Bishop Johnson. <coughs> <coughs> it has nothing to do with what else? Obeying the law. It has nothing to do with being good. Nothing. That's what Paul is saying. Why is he saying this? Because the other people were saying the only way God can justify you is based on what you can do. By obeying the law, by uh, obeying the Ten Commandments. And Paul is saying, no, no, that's not the message I'm preaching. And the Judaizer would say, no, if you, if you can have that, but you still need to be circumcised. So justification, as we are saying here, uh, Paul defends it right now of the gospel. He preached, he defends justification. He says he received his authority to preach this gospel through the revelation from God. His authority to preach the gospel are proof. And so, so you know what Paul is doing? He said, this message I'm preaching is not strange 
because one, I receive it from God directly. Now that would, that would be a problem today. If somebody comes to you and say, why the church has been preaching all this time, that's not true. I got a new message now, I'm coming to preach. And everything you've been preaching all these years, that's wrong. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Paul is defending this message he's preaching. He say he received it by God. I will come back to that justification because it has implications. I think Bishop Johnson deals with that tonight too. Okay? Now follow me here. Okay? Now we are leaving Bible study method. I mean, we are doing a word study. Again, this is a, Madeline, yeah. this is a theological term. Here, we are breaking down a doctrine called salvation. And the big words they use in theology is soteriology. Uh, I'm not sure I'm spelling it correctly. But listen now. The believer, the Christian, goes through one justification and something else we call sanctification. Now, some people can even put something here called uh, regeneration. Bear with me. Okay, we don't have much time. And glorification. Here, we begin first with the sinner standing before God. What is my status when as a sinful person I come to God? How, on what basis does God accept me? That's why this piece deals with me. Some, as the Judeans that were saying, you do, you try to be perfect. And then God will accept you. And how you become perfect? By obeying the law. Right? I am boring you people like something. No, okay, yeah, listen now. The issue we are facing is the sinner standing before God. Mm -hmm. How is that rectified? On what basis God accept me in the first place? Some say you got to be perfect. You got to do everything in your power to be acceptable to God. Then God will uh, uh, receive you. Right? I mean, I don't know about some churches or background you have about holiness. I told you about a <coughs> story I had about this young man who was witnessing in a taxi. And the first thing he was telling the, the, uh, the taxi driver was, eh, battling, mm -hmm. you got to stop that smoking business you're doing. <laughs> okay? You got to stop that, that woman business, I mean the way you can do woman business. You got to stop drinking. Right? Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? Rules. In other words, once I do this, then God can accept me. That's normal, right? Right. Mm -hmm. If I go through certain regulations, if I go through certain ceremonies first, then on that basis of that, God will justify me. He will forgive me. Then He can accept me now into the kingdom of God. And our Lord said, I did not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mm -hmm. That's the question I'm coming to ask, Pastor. Okay. Are you perceiving that? Mm -hmm. So, Galatians and Romans are dealing with the whole problem. On what basis does God accept a sinful person? Is it based on anything I have to do? Or does God just justify me? Declare me his child. And Bishop Johnson started his class by quoting Ephesians chapter 2. For we were what? Dead. 
in trespasses and sins. And God quickened us. What he is saying is, this is what we are calling regeneration. And his argument was, somebody who is dead in sin cannot help themselves. You need a power from within, from outside of you, to quicken you, for you to respond. So it's not based on human efforts. So what Galatians uh, chapter 1, to all the way to 3, in fact, 431 is dealing with is this whole piece of our relationship with God. And Shalom, how does God receive a sinful individual? And Paul said it is God gave it freely. Salvation is free and it is received by faith. And it's based on God's mercy and Christ's works. Okay? Are you going I'm putting you on this. Now, do you see now when we deal with this, it leaves another problem here. If God just forgives me then, what happened to how I lived my life? And starting with chapter 5, justification by how justification, how justification number 4, how justification by faith works. Paul is saying now, here, Martha, Magdalene, we are dealing with a holiness issue now. You cannot be holy until you are justified. You can't put this in here before somebody who doesn't have the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't run around, don't do woman business. When the person is still not regenerated. They can't do that in their own power. No. So the whole time, this thing has six chapters in Galatians. The first three chapters, in fact up to chapter 4 verse 31, is dealing with this piece. How a sinner is received by God. Huh. And that's what Paul is dealing with. And his opponents were saying, the, one, the way you can do this is by obeying law. Paul said, mm -mm, that cannot work. And then, if you read Romans chapter 7, he described the struggle that he himself went through. The good that I want to do, I don't do it. The evil that I don't want to do, that's the very thing I'm doing. Amen. And then he said, oh, wretched person that I am. <laughs> Who will deliver me from this? Anybody here? Mm -hmm. So that's why Galatians, so Paul did that. <clears throat> he defends justification by faith. Uh, in, in number two, he explains what he means by justification by faith. He talks about his own personal experience. He talks about the example from Abraham. He talks about the Old Testament law. He talks about his own personal testimony. And like I was trying to explain to you, he uses allegory. So, now, he is building a case for this message he is preaching. Yeah, he doesn't just get angry and <coughs> start fighting with people. Okay. Okay. You people are theological students. So Paul did an excellent job. Okay. He defends his gospel. He explains why he's preaching. And then in part two, as you can see here, he gives five reasons why his message he's preaching is the correct one. It's experience. Maybe we should read part of it too. You can argue about it. Okay. Let me pause for a second to see whether this is making sense to people first. In other words, what I'm doing here is what are we doing? I'm trying to do first by giving the outline, I'm giving you an overview of the whole book. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing in a survey. Number two, we do an analysis by the chapter, breaking down the chapter, 
chapter, and then we might even define words. <coughs> right? So that's what I was doing by providing a detailed outline. I'm giving you an analysis of the of the book. Mm -hmm. And then we will finally come to what we are calling synthesis. We put it together, then we want to ask, what is the book about? Or it can be a passage. You take a passage. Is this getting complicated a little bit? <laughs> I have a question, Pastor. Sure. So in Paul case, how do we relate to the not um not being called by man but by God in our time today? That's a good question. That's a good question. But do you okay. But do you get this uh method that we are using first? Right? Mm -hmm. I want you to understand it, then we can ask this question. You see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. First, I'm, I'm giving you an overview of the book, and it helps that we did the book background study, okay? And then, the outline gives some kind of what is in each part of the book, right? Mm -hmm. And then we'll go back and we'll ask questions about what is this whole book about? I don't want to be distracted. Matthew, I will come to your question. But I want you to get the skills of doing this. You can use it on a book or you can use it on a passage. If one we tried was what? Philippians 4.19. And then we did, we got an overview. We said that it was the church in Philippi. Then we will do this text. Why did he say this? We said because they were a giving church. So this one is a small one, right? Because they are a giving church. That's why you could say that. Uh, then maybe if you want to do a synthesis, what did you get? If a church is a giving church, then we can conclude that God will supply the needs of that person who is generous to God. Amen. Right? Amen. So just using one verse, we can apply the same principles. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. In the case of Galatians, we are using the whole book to use this. You can use it on a verse. You can use it on a maybe a chapter. Uh, is this making sense? Mm -hmm. So say you are doing your presentation on the book survey method of Bible study. I don't expect you to do a whole book. You can do a verse. Right? It's an easy one you can even do. Uh, Philippians. Is that 10? I want to know him. His power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering. Right? So you do a background to find out who is saying this? What does he mean? Right? So you do an overview first. And then you break it down. I will walk with God. But we might conclude like that. It requires knowing him in this, in this, and that. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. This is a scale that. Now let's before let's before we finish, let's answer Madeline's question. You are saying what? If Paul is saying that he did not receive his his what? His calling from human beings, mm -hmm. then you say what? I don't know. In our day, how do we relate to that? All right, let's use. I will answer it two ways. Let's use Hellman's, Hellman's uh, paradigm. You tell what? Past, present, and future. Right? Before I answer, okay, you remind me because I will answer Madeline's question from the notes. But let's use this. 
how were people called in the past? Right? Let's do that. If people were called, how were they called in the past? God spoke with some people individually. Okay. Like Moses, even Abraham, even the prophet Samuel. Okay. Some ways. So God called you, he talked to you directly. Mm -hmm. Right, Madam? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, wait now. Let's yeah, you say past now. In the past, God God spoke to some people. Okay. Mm -hmm. Directly. Directly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And some people ask Jesus if they can follow him. Okay. Too in the past. Okay. So not everybody was spoken to by God. Some people choose to follow Jesus. Okay. In his time. But I'm talking in our present. But, but, but what we are find, what we are trying to do is this is an okay, important. Okay, God, the past, the present, and the future. Okay. So if that's how people were. Call in the past, Madeline. Mm -hmm. Is that a prescription of how he calls today? Mm -hmm. Does he use the same method? That's what we want to find out. Possibly, yeah. yes. Eh? yes. So he can speak to you directly. You can desire from based on your thing to say, I want to come to the ministry, right? Mm -hmm. What was the other way? Directly. Dreams. People Dreams. volunteer. Eh? Dreams. Okay, that's still direct. And then uh, maybe the Levitical aspect where during the after Moses gave the law, the in the priesthood, the Levitical, those who were born in the Okay, so maybe pastors' children. So if you had children tell my children I don't want them to be pastors. I was through prophets though. Okay, prophecy. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So Madeline, you can receive it directly. Indirectly. Uh through a prophecy. Bishop Bishop Obari oh, with no class next week. Well uh Prophet Bimba would be here, see. Amelia, God is calling you to be a missionary in China. <laughs> All right, you're shaking your head, you know. <laughs> yeah, this is me. Oh, you see that? All right. Well, okay. But there's one element that you people are not talking, and we can find it from here. Look at your notes. Look at. Number two, Paul says he what? He received his authority to preach. Oh, I put, I put in the past tense. Oh man, to preach his gospel through what? Revelation, Revelation from God. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. Okay. That's exactly what you are saying, Michael. I got it directly from God. No human being gave it to me. But look at number two, and I keep making mistakes. His authority to preach his gospel was what? Approved. Ah. <laughs> ah. By the leaders. Godly men and women. Say yes. We know that God spoke to you. But we can attest to the call of God on your life. Yeah, 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 not one yet. Mm -hmm. That's why we do ordination and licensing. To hmm. say, oh yes, we agree that God actually called you. That's the um, human structure. Well, it's by the Jerusalem Church. And, I mean, it just it's all. So you can say, I don't need any church. God called me. I'm, I'm taking no paper from no better people. God called me. I'm just going. Uh, hallelujah. Well, it's a, uh, 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 uh. Well, you call this to be rebellious. Well, not rebellious. I say, church in Jerusalem, I prove you. <laughs> the John agree. The James agree. The Peter agree. Later on, they agree. Well, Paul say, I receive it from God, but I went to Jerusalem, and the people say, yeah. Oh, Paul, yeah, we believe that you are called. Go to the Gentiles. 
Because he wanted to go there. <laughs> no, he didn't want to go there. Because plenty of people run around, and by the time you look, they are ordained. <laughs> they, start, they start their own church, they are bishop. Okay? Nobody testified that they are being called. Nobody knows their theology where they went to school. What their qualification is. Paul said, I went to the church. Something else he did. Okay? And Paul, too, he, he was a high headed man. Oh, yeah. uh, he stood up to authority. <laughs> Okay. Okay. But what I want to say, I'm not telling. So, I think this formula is for the past, the present, and the future. One, you receive it from God. Now, today, how do we know somebody receive it from God? The evidence of what? You come to me and you say, Pastor Friday, I'm called. I believe God called me to preach. How do, do I know? Your your attitude, your, your life. Mm -hmm. oh, what? Speaking in tongues. No. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you have Paul before so, Paul went so to boy, before Paul went to Jerusalem. He went. He started churches. He preached. There was testimony. Oh, yes. People got saved. Through his ministry, he could authenticate that God had called him. It was clear to everybody. In some instances, he said the signs of if you are called to preach, you will know how to preach. You may not be perfect, yeah. but somebody can say, "Yeah, this boy guy, he got to have some skills." He, you know, when he's sick. but you know how to even pronounce faith. Then you say you got to preach. <laughs> Okay. Oh, and you oh. know how many members, right? Pastor, is that everybody that preach, that called to preach? Mm. That's a question. No. Hmm. I, this is the gospel according to Not Friday. I believe when somebody is called <coughs> to do something, you will see what I'm calling us. There'll be something. There's some kind of potentiality, I think. There was the old, old man I keep talking about. Oh, some, I gotta stop in the next five minutes. But somebody stands in front of church, they may not know a lot, but you can sense that they, mm -hmm. there's something the potential in them. Mm -hmm. Is, are people called to preach or people are called um, Jesus gave gifting to people and preaching is just a general word that can be used in those different gifting like the uh, fearful ministry and thing okay we're going to when we the word we are using advanced preaching, we'll get to that. when we get to advanced preaching we'll do that but this is this, uh, uh, the, the, the thing is there are three types of calling do you, you put no right no 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 not this one there are three three types of calling okay <laughs> so I mean, be getting you ready for that then. Three types of calling. If you put say then you pass this course. Oh. <laughs> if you can give me the three types of calling you. You don't need to do anything in this class. Vocations. We're gonna bring it next week? No now. We can Google. I don't know where you can find it. So One. Traditional? Vocational. Call. Call. To be saved. Call salvation. It's for everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. God yeah. so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son. Believe. Then the call mm -hmm. to discipleship. This is for Christians alone. You are called to pray, you are called to witness, you are called to attend church, you are called to, to give, you are called to, to live as a Christian in the society. That's your calling. Okay? You can't say, oh no, I wasn't called to be 
to 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 be holy or nothing like that. Right. Then call. Call. I am not calling in ministry because we are all in ministry. I'll call it to a specific task. You will not pass that test. Okay. You see? And from what Helmet is saying, this is based on my gift and I'm calling it on my passion and on my place. If I have a job to do, I will have to have the ability. I'm called to be a Sunday school teacher, I have to know how to teach. I'm called to be an intercessor, I gotta know how to pray. I'm called to the priest and worship ministry. I can't sing like not Friday. <laughs> okay? Then you might have a passion for it. If I'm doing it, I do enjoy it, man. This is it's a birthday. Oh man, people I going to single. People, yeah. people are going to preach and worship again. Oh man, I can't believe. There has to be some joy about it now. Jeremiah said he didn't want to do it. But he said, when I stop, I can't stop. Then, there will be places where people are accepted, where they want it. So you go down there, and one pastor say, I don't want you in my church, then you should go somewhere where you talk. <coughs> Jesus said, when you go somewhere where they don't want you, where people keep and go somewhere else. All right. So, with that, people can do a book background study, right? Quick, quick, quick last question. I don't know whether sure. this passage is referring to what I want to ask. I didn't sure. double check. In the, the third, in number two, mm -hmm. C, was the uh, revelation given by Peter in connection with Cornelius. Mm -hmm. was, can we say that was a form of. Um, yeah, listen to a helmet. The revelation given by Peter. To, I mean, about Cornelius, before you could go to Cornelius' house. Can we say was uh, evidence of what Paul was saying somehow in, in his life or in Peter's life? In, in, I mean, as far as his calling, his own calling that people were, you know, disputing in some ways because they were not a, 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 in agreement with him as far as saying it's not about the law. It's about oh, all right, okay. Yeah. Now, sometimes you speak. Uh, you speak like a prophet, so I don't understand it sometimes. Um, <laughs> but what have many things? That's a good one. What have many things? Peter had a revelation in Acts chapter 10 where God told him to go to Cornelius' house, Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And Peter had a struggle with that. So, everybody is asking. Does that prove Paul's point that salvation is based on, uh, on justification of without obeying the law? You go tell it, I got to Peter. Go to the end that eat one will eat him. And Peter was saying, You have so much Jew. Mm -hmm. But you don't know that Paul could have used that. So say, Peter, you should know better. You remember what God told you yourself? That Gentiles are not saved by this. They lost. But the point he is making it, or we are making it, is, and I think if we are sincere in our hearts, we know that none of us can be perfect. No way. <clears throat> okay? We will know that our salvation is dependent on God's mercy. Because as, as much as we try, we always come up short. And if God doesn't justify us by His mercy and by Christ's mercy alone, we would never make it to heaven. Mm. Wow. And that's why Paul was insisting on, say, don't pollute the gospel. Don't put it on human effort because nobody will make it. It has to be by God. Yeah. And even our holiness is derived from the, from the Holy Spirit. He changes the human heart. Don't try to do it by your own. And, and then he was rebuked. He said, Peter, you know that we are Jews. We know that we can't obey this law. So why are you trying to force Gentiles to do something that we Jews have not been able to do over the centuries? 
God bless you. Those of you who are not taking Bishop Johnson's class. Ali.